Matthew 9, beginning in verse 27. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Here we have, we continue to have a record of more miraculous signs and wonders that Jesus performed during his earthly ministry with his disciples. These miracles are not just randomly recorded so that we know that Jesus could perform miracles. There is an intended message and meaning behind the supernatural wonders that he performs, and there's even a meaning and intention behind the way that Matthew records them. In carefully reading through the text of Scripture, we always want to be open to what God is teaching us about Jesus, about our faith in him, about our walk with him, What does that kind of openness look like when it comes to a passage like this that just deals with another miracle? I mean, here we are at the end of a long string of miracles that Matthew's been talking about that we've covered over these past weeks. What does, being open to what God wants to say, what does that mean for a passage like this one? Well, here's how I would illustrate it. Uh, A little over a decade ago now, During his personal devotional time, John Piper came across Matthew 16, where Jesus says to his disciples, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Leaven, of course, is used to make bread dough rise, and it seems awfully clear when you hear Jesus talk that way that he is speaking in a metaphor. The Pharisees, after all, are not literally selling or distributing leaven, but the disciples, nevertheless, miss the point. And they start squabbling about how they had forgotten to bring bread. And Jesus hears this going on, and so he says to them, Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves? For the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or don't you remember the seven loaves for the 4,000? And how many baskets you gathered after that? How is it that you fail to understand? I'm not speaking about bread. Piper says, I just thought, what is Jesus saying? He's, He's saying that if they had really understood the miracle where he fed thousands with a little bit of bread, then they would have perceived the meaning of the metaphor. And he said, my takeaway is that they totally misunderstood him and they missed the metaphorical meaning and they went straight to the literal meaning. Clearly, the disciples did not understand his miracle and that had a bad interpretive effect. Our takeaway is that we should slow down in our reading. And when we finish reading about a miracle, we should pause and say something like, Jesus, show me what this is saying about you. And then fall down 
to worship him. And let the account of that miracle have its humbling and strengthening effect on us, us as we think, I have a Christ who not only feeds 5,000, but then gives 12 baskets to the 12 men who were distributing it. This is huge. Jesus is saying, I will take care of all your needs. And for the disciples, the point of the feeding of the 5,000 was the 12 baskets left over. Through his miracle, Jesus is saying that if you go ahead and give away even what you don't have, you are still going to get everything that you need. So when we come later and Jesus says, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees, the first thought of the disciples should not be, oh shoot, we forgot to bring bread. No, their first thought should be, What is it about the Pharisees that might undermine my faith? By understanding the miracles of Jesus rightly, they will start to see. To do this, you don't need any scholarly training. You don't have to know Greek. You don't even have to go to seminary. You just need to slow down with an open heart and pray, think, and worship over the miracles of Jesus. Carrie Jenkins had a similar aha moment on this point. She said, as I read the stories of Jesus, I realized every miracle not only evidenced the power of God at work, but each miracle was a metaphor for a deeper and everlasting healing. So let's be honest, she said, each physical miracle ended at some point. Each person who was healed is not still alive today. They did eventually die. The once dead Lazarus, who then was raised, eventually died again. But there was an eternal factor, message in that miracle. Every miracle Jesus performed was a metaphor for the good news. The blind were not only given their physical sight, but they were invited to see things now in a new way. The eyes of their heart were opened, and they were able to see Jesus for who he was and who he continues to be. So, we come now to this passage of miracles and before we dig into the text, I just, I want to get briefly academic for a moment and uh, answer three uh, introductory questions related to miracles. You could think of it as just a little uh, introductory crash course on miracles, okay? So here, let's begin question number one. What is a miracle? And it's not just finding a parking spot when you couldn't find, nobody else found one. Richard Pertill defines it this way, a miracle is an event that is brought about by the power of God that is a temporary exception to the ordinary course of nature for the purpose of showing that God is acting in history. That he is real, that he is alive, that he is acting. Are miracles happening today? Well, if you're interested in that subject, I'd point you to a couple of uh, resources. Lee Strobel has written a book called The Case for Miracles, and Craig Keener has written uh, a number of books. One of them is at least two volumes. In some sets, I think it comes in three volumes, where he defends the validity of uh, supernatural acts in the Gospels and Acts, the book of Acts. But here's what Lee Strobel writes, as I began researching this book, The Case for Miracles, my curiosity prompted me to commission a national scientific survey which was conducted then by Barna Research. Most of all, I wanted to know how many people have had an experience that they can only explain as being a miracle of God. And as it turns out, 
nearly two out of every five U.S. adults, that would be people over 18 years of age, 38% of Americans said that they have had such an experience. Which, if you extrapolate that out over the American population, means 94,792,000 Americans are convinced that God has performed at least one miracle for them personally. An astonishing number. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wow, you know Americans, and you just think that they're, they're thinking wrongly about miracles. Even if you... Even if you wrote off 99% of them as not being valid, you're still left with over 9 million. It's like a lot of testimonial evidence there that we need to consider for which Jesus gets glory and honor. Because this is a crash course, let me cite a British theologian, David Wenham, who in this peer-reviewed International Evangelical Theological Journal that expounds and defends the historic Christian faith. Back in the December issue, focused on this, he did a study of the entire New Testament, a survey of the entire New Testament, and distilled it down to these principles regarding miracles. First, it is correct to see that the church does have a commission to heal in the name of Jesus and to expect God's power to work miraculously. And it is good to be challenged to such expectancy. Two, it is not the case that there is guaranteed healing for every sickness. Such universal healing belongs to the future, when the kingdom which Jesus inaugurated will be consummated or that God's miraculous gifts will be seen in every church and time in the measure that they were in Jesus' ministry. That's just not true. Jesus tends to move at certain times, certain epochs. Today, even if you believe in the existence of miracles today, they tend to be clustered oftentimes around the growing edges where the gospel is penetrating new areas. Talk to missiologists. Third, the miraculous workings of the Spirit are wonderful but they are by no means the most important work of the Spirit. The Spirit's major work is converting sinful people to Christ and then making them increasingly like Him, producing in them the fruit of the Spirit, notably love, and helping them in suffering, not necessarily by removing it, but often by giving the grace to endure it. Some of the same conclusions may be applicable also to the question of demons and supernatural evil. It is right to recognize the existence of demons, but there is a danger of making too much of them and of seeing demons behind every problem or sickness or trouble. There is a good side to this attitude in that it takes evil and Satan seriously in a way that the New Testament encourages. We live in a world where there is a conflict between God and Satan. And we need to be more aware of this than we often are. However, there is a difference between recognizing the reality and power of evil and then seeing demons around every corner in an almost semi-animistic way. It's like you can almost make idols out of healings and miracles so that they now become the whole point. You can do the same with your understanding of dynamics within the spiritual dimension. You can go too far, see it too much. Third question, what is the purpose of miracles? Well, New Testament professor Craig Keener writes, in the Bible, divine signs get the attention of those who are open to God but they bring to the surface the hostility of those who are not. So the biblical standard for a signs or a wonders, a miracle's success, the biblical standard for that is not that it convinces everyone. It is that it gets people's attention. Often, in the process, it exposes the attitude found in people's hearts. Jesus' miracles were a sign of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. They were a taste of the future where healing is going to be complete 
And Jesus is the one who said that if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then you know what this means? The kingdom of God has come upon you. These signs were a prelude to the entire restoration when God will make a new heaven and a new earth and they remind us that the day is coming when there will be no more suffering and pain. That day is ahead. And the, the miracles should keep flashing that truth to us. So with that foundation laid, we'll close the clash, crash course here. And I want to move on to our text then in Matthew 9, which begins in 9, 27 to 31 with Jesus restoring sight to two blind men. And the account begins in verse 27 with a charged and desperate expression. It says, as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, have mercy on us, son of David. I'd say that it, it begins with a charged expression because these two blind men in public were screaming out loud that Jesus was the son of David. Now it's very significant that the very first verse in Matthew's gospel reads this way. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And so, in one sense, this could be called one of the main themes of the whole book. Jesus is the son of David. It's, it's what people cried uh, at the event that we're commemorating on Palm Sunday. Hosanna to the son of David. Save us. That's what Hosanna means. Save us, son of David. The title Son of David goes all the way back in the Hebrew Scriptures to the place where the prophet Nathanael makes a glorious promise to King David in 1 Chronicles 17 where we read these words. God says through the prophet to David, David, when your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from him who was before you, but I will confirm him as king over my house and my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. There it is, a promise straight from God through Nathan the prophet to David. David, you're going to have a son who will reign as king forever. And his throne is going to be established forever, and his reign will never come to an end. When you hear that kind of promise, that kind of detail, it kind of reminds you of a passage that we usually read around Christmas time. Isaiah 9, 7, Of the son born to a virgin, it is said, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David... And over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. On the throne of David forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is a politically charged title, son of David. Down through the centuries, God's people had put their hope in this promise this is where the whole idea of Messiah comes from. A messianic leader who would lead them to peace with a limitless and eternal reign. So calling Jesus at that time, in that place, son of David, was virtually the same as declaring he is the promised Messiah. And Spurgeon notes, even the blind could see that Jesus was David's son. But then in verse 28, Jesus, upon hearing this desperate, uh, politically charged cry, Jesus gives a delayed response and attaches a condition to it in verse 28. When Jesus entered the house, the blind men came in to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. So, if you follow the flow here, 
Jesus seems to ignore, initially ignore the cries of these blind men until he gets inside the house. He's done this kind of thing before where he waits until they're inside the house rather than do it out in public. And the reason he does this is because he uh, fully understands the incomplete messianic expectations of his day. That the people were only expecting a political revolutionary to lead the nation to overthrow Roman domination. And yes, it is true that the Messiah will be king, ruling over every other authority. That's true. But the people missed the point of Isaiah 53, that first, the Messiah would come as a suffering servant. They missed that part. So for Jesus to be publicly promoted as the Messiah now would bring down the wrath of the Roman government before the appointed time. Once they are inside the house, Jesus engages the two blind men by asking them a question. Do you believe I can do this? And their answer is their expression of faith. Yes, Lord. Amen. That's what amen means. Yes, Lord. It's one thing Jesus understood to make pious public praises, and it's quite another to put your faith in the person of Jesus as these men do. Thus, verse 29 and the beginning of verse 30 describe an intimate and affirming miracle. They said, yes, Lord, and then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it done to you, and their eyes were opened. Just pay attention here to the kindness and the compassion of our Savior. Eye diseases in his day were grossly repulsive. Just as he had done with the man with leprosy back at the beginning of chapter 8, Jesus physically reaches out and touches the eyes of these blind men, healing them instantly. Jesus loves faith. He loves it when people trust him. Faith provides an opportunity to focus the glory on Jesus himself. Jesus enters into our deepest point of need. He comes into our brokenness. He comes into our addiction, into our disease. Wherever And whatever in our lives needs redeeming and restoring, He is there. And so there is a message to us in this passage not to wall off sin and sickness from Him, but instead to invite Him in with His power and compassion to bring healing. Do you believe He can do this? And along with the healing, you'll notice, surprisingly perhaps, Jesus then immediately issues a stern warning to them, verses 30 and 31. So their eyes were opened and Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all the district. So why did Jesus warn them? as we've already touched on, because his time to engage the Roman government has not yet come. He doesn't want to publicly be known as the son of David at this point because it will short-circuit his mission. But something happens in this story that is very instructive for us. Having received this unspeakable gift of God's grace in the form of restored eyesight, these men disobey Jesus. Some thanks to the Messiah. 
Maybe it's because they assume that Jesus was just being modest. You know, don't tell anybody. Let's just keep this between us. But in any event, notice what happens here. This is, this is instructive. Their experience became more important than their submission to his instructions. And we are tempted in these ways today, especially in seeking after the way we might seek after miracles. Frederick Dale Bruner, in Christian theology, we believe that where persons place their trust in Jesus Christ and receive his grace, they receive at the same time the gift of the Holy Spirit. This story should instruct us that even when we have had an experience of grace or a reception of the Spirit, obedience to the simple commands of Jesus is not something dispensable, nor is it something you can say is legalistic. The Christian life is not, first of all, lived in a glow of wonderful experience. It is lived more soberly, first of all, in simple obedience to Jesus' commanding words. Our experience, our feelings, our best thinking, even some leading from, we think, the Holy Spirit, should never move us to contradict Jesus' commands. Jesus has clear commands about human relations, about social ethics, commands that deserve trust as much as words about healing and salvation. Because in the end, what are we doing? We are making disciples, as Matthew makes clear in the last chapter, 28. He is te- we are teaching people in such a way that they obey everything that Jesus taught, that they accept a whole Jesus as he is presented in the whole Bible. In other words, we don't just want to know about some spiritual experience that you may have had. What we want to know is what the, those closest to you think about your love and joy and peace. How are you doing in your patience and kindness and goodness faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. But then, just as they were leaving the house, Jesus encounters another man in desperate need. Verse 32. As they're going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. Now, the Greek word that's used here to describe the man's condition down through centuries here has always referred to someone who is deaf and mute. So they're unable to hear and unable to speak. And the account, you may notice as you look at it here, is very streamlined. We're not told, as we have been with other miracle stories, if Jesus said something. We're not told if he touched the man. We're not told whether the man had faith. We're simply told that Jesus, again, demonstrates his incomparable authority over spiritual and physical conditions. Here, a demonically induced condition in verse 33. And look what, look what happens. It's just stripped down to the bare essentials. First half of verse 33. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. Another one of God's priceless gifts to us that we take for granted every day. The ability to speak, to communicate with each other. Some have called the miracles that we're focusing on today social miracles because they restore the ability to build community with others. These desperate people who come to Jesus walk away now with sight and with hearing and speech, gracious gifts that make a real loving community a possibility. And maybe this is precisely where we fall down and worship him and let the account of these miracles have its humbling and strengthening effect 
on us. But now, the streamlined message comes down to a very precise point. And that point is, what will our response be to Jesus? So, verses 33 and 34, the eyes were opened, Jesus, I mean 33, uh, and when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, and they said, never was anything like this seen in Israel, but, by contrast, the Pharisees said, well, we know, he casts out demons by the prince of demons. So remember, these divine signs and wonders have a dual effect on those who witness them. You'd think that someone standing there watching Jesus actually open the eyes of a blind person or the ears of someone who's deaf or unleash the tongue of a mute person. You'd think that when they see that, it would produce faith. But that's not always the case. Those who are open come to faith. Or they find their faith strengthened by observing the power of God to set people free and heal them and restore them. But those who are not open with soft hearts toward God and His Word only become hardened by what they see. Even when it is a rock-solid, verifiable miracle, they will find another way to interpret it because of the predisposition of their heart. This is why Jesus later comes to the point where he refuses to perform any more miracles. Luke 16, 31, we find the statement, if people will not listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Which is kind of a spoiler alert for next weekend, but <laughs> some of you know how the story ends. Earlier I said that the way Matthew records these supernatural wonders is not random. The author has an intent here. And you can see it in the structure. Chapters 8 and 9 structurally have presented three sets of three miracles with some discipleship material in between. And Bruner points out that just here in chapter 9, Matthew has presented us with, first, a bold faith, then a touching faith, then a deathless faith, and now here we saw the story of these blind men, a pursuing faith. I mean, come on, they pursue Jesus, and when he goes in the house, they just walk right in his house with him. But now, fifth, in this chapter, he pursues his readers themselves, asking the question, what about your faith? Are you like these people impressed with Jesus, or are you like the leaders of these people, the ones with the power, who are unimpressed? Matthew, like all good evangelists, is asking in the end for a decision. This miracle is told so that the evangelist can pursue our faith. And in this miracle, it's we, the listeners to the story, who, if mute or tongue-tied, are invited to spoken decision for Christ. Readers are asked to take sides here, and so to allow Jesus' impact on them to heal them of their speechlessness to confess Jesus. Some of us need our tongues unloosed to talk about Jesus because we're so afraid to ever do it. And what people might think. But when God opens up your tongue, your ears, your eyes, your heart, when he does this, you become the tenth miracle in this string of miracles. And the Messiah demands your response. That's how the story's told here. The fork in the road. The point of this story is we are brought to a fork in the road regarding our own personal response to Jesus even today when we read it. Do you trust him? Do you believe that he is able to bring healing and hope into the most painful and threatening part of your life right now? And if you believe that, have you ever invited him into that place? He is the miracle-working Messiah. Let's pray.
Lord, we acknowledge you as Messiah, the son of David, the promised king. Your miracles testify to your authority. They confirm the validity of your claims. Lord, you continue. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You reign as king today. And while we, have, we, we can't allow ourselves to be presumptuous about healing, we still would ask you, Lord, in your name and for your glory, that you would be gracious to people in need here who look to you for healing and hope, that you would enter into their brokenness in places of distress and their diseases and addictions. And God, that there might be stories of your transforming, saving, forgiving, healing power. We do trust you. We do believe that you are able to do anything because all authority in heaven and earth has been given to you. And for those of us who believe but still waver, help our unbelief, I pray, that we would continually, above all, be faithful to your word, faithful to you as revealed in the word. That's what we ask. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen.